Welcome to the Kyperian Commentary Podcast. I'm your host, Rick Davis, and today we're going to be talking to my senior pastor, Virgil Hurt. I've known Virgil for over 20 years, and he's been not only a friend, but a mentor and an example to many men and families at Providence Church here in Lynchburg. Uh, Virgil is also the presiding minister of the Communion of Reformed Evangelical Churches, and this year marks the 25th anniversary of the CREC as a denomination. And so we're going to be talking to Virgil today about what he sees as the future of the CREC. So Virgil, welcome to the podcast. Glad to get to talk to you here. Thank you. Glad to be here. So uh, first question I want to ask you, and we can just talk about this. This is your last year as presiding minister. And so you will have uh, been in the position for about six years. Mm -hmm. uh, many of our listeners I know are CREC folks, but some are not. So do you want to talk just a bit about what the presiding minister does and maybe what sorts of changes you've seen in the CREC over the last six years? Uh, well, what does the presiding minister do? Our, uh, we we're, have seven presbyteries. Each of those presbyteries has a presiding minister over the presbyteries that range anywhere from 10 to about 25 churches. And um, and then over the, the council, CRC council is the uh, deliberative body above the presbyteries where appeals would be made, where constitutional changes would be made and that sort of thing. And I oversee that. So um, the the regular main job of the presiding minister is to plan our council meeting, which is only every three years and where all of the presbyteries come together at the same place and they have the presbytery meetings then we have a council meeting and consider any um, constitutional changes or book of procedure changes and other sorts of things in between that time uh, you the presiding minister is the person who gets emails from prospective folks interested in crc or pastors or churches, <clears throat> pastors who are looking uh, for a call within the CREC. Um, so a lot of following up on those sorts of things, referring those, uh, those people to the presiding ministers of the presbyteries that govern um, you know, the area where the person is making the inquiry from, uh, um, making statements about cultural issues that are going on that affect the church. Uh, and staying in contact with various presiding ministers uh, of the presbyteries, particularly, is is my my role. So you mentioned fielding inquiries about churches joining the CREC or, or coming into the CREC. Is that something you've seen an increase of in the last few years? Yes, um, we have on our uh, CREC website a, a link to me to my email address to ask about planting a church or interest. And a few years ago, I, I would get those emails occasionally. Um, I don't know, maybe one a month or something like that. I get them now probably four or five a week. On almost almost every day, I get an email from somebody somewhere saying, we need a CREC church in our town. Uh, is the CREC planning on planting a church in our town? So I get those very regularly now. I refer those generally to the presiding ministers. Some of those are turning into groups of people uh, and potentially church plants. And there's a lot of that going on right now. So that especially the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of growth in our uh, various churches, uh, individual churches. Many of our churches were, most of our churches are pretty small. And ev even a few years ago, we only had a handful of churches that were over 200 members. In the last couple of years, a lot of those churches have doubled in size, or some of them have tripled in size even. So there's been a rapid growth and in interest in who we are and what we're doing. So are you mostly seeing individuals who want to plant churches, groups coming together to create churches, or churches who want to come into the CREC as an already existing church? All of the above. Um, it's not a, a, a large number, but for us, so we have about a hundred and I think 107 churches worldwide. So if we have, you know, eight or 10 or 15 of those churches, that's a, a relatively large percentage of growth. And on top of that, we've in, in actual numbers of 
CREC members, there's about another 15 or 20% growth uh, in the last couple of years. So a uh, pretty rapid increase for us, the same sort of thing we've seen in our church here in Lynchburg. As you know, we've had a, a large number of people uh, join our church in the last couple of years. So uh, that trend is happening across the board in the CREC, especially in the places, nice places to live where people are moving to. Uh, there's a large enough population where the churches are growing. Those those churches are are rapidly growing, at least rapid by by our standards. <laughs> so why would why would someone want to be part of the CREC? Uh, well, there's a lot of good reasons. I um, our doctrine, mo- our our churches are essentially. Um, Presbyterian, uh, obviously the communion of reformed evangelicals were reformed. Almost all of our churches are either Westminster uh, confession of faith, as far as our standards or the three forms. So strongly reformed. So our doctrine is one appeal, but that's really not the main reason we're seeing people come. Uh, the, the, Thing that we're seeing in our church and as i talk to other pastors and other churches this is also true the last couple of years have revealed various things in culture that have also popped up in the church so as the culture has uh, gone more and more crazy and and i guess this way to to the left on various social issues the church has been dramatically influenced by that so some of the woke kind of culture embracing um you know first of all it was sort of embracing uh, women pastors but then that gets pushed into embracing the whole homosexual agenda and now the trans craziness and we see that looniness going on in the culture uh at large and we think that well that wouldn't be in the church or certainly wouldn't be in the evangelical church but it is and so there is this softness that's popped up within the the broader church and um, most of the people who come to us are coming from fairly solid churches. They're coming from um, Reformed Baptist churches often. We've seen most of the people coming to our church from uh, just more Baptist churches. But this pressure within the Southern Baptist Convention, this pressure that's even building in the, in the PCA and other places, uh, the, the, the conservatives who really want to just be obedient to the Bible, worship God, and just follow the Bible straight up the middle are getting frustrated. And uh, the CREC has become a place where they, they when they check us out, they see the word of God being preached down the middle. Um, not a lot of, at least not yet, uh, dramatic influence from the culture. We pray that we would be resistant to that. We know we're not immune to it. Uh, and we pray for God's grace to give us strength to resist the, the pressures that are in the culture at large. But at this point, uh, our men, our pastors, and our churches have been strongly unified. On We're Bible people. We preach the Bible. We read the Bible. We live the Bible. And when people come here, they see that strength, and especially as it plays out in various areas. Our worship, which is really strong, or our music in our churches, which is strong, historical psalms and hymns, as well as our, um, our practical application. Our emphasis on yeah. strong marriages, raising godly children, um, being uh, salt and light in your culture as you advance throughout the culture and having cultural impact. So those kinds of things uh, people constantly tell us. And actually, a few things that I, I often overlook because there's so much of the air that we b- breathe is uh, the joy that we have in coming to worship, uh, actually enjoying going to church. After church, the people don't leave because they like each other and they want to spend time together. Um, inviting people into your home with hospitality and food fellowship. Those are things we take yeah. for granted. Sometimes we forget to even talk about them because it's so much who we are. But yeah. what we're hearing over and over again from people outside that come into our churches is that that wasn't their experience in their prior church. And so that's a whole new world of our church culture that people really uh, love and embrace. And so they visit uh, sometimes our churches because of our, a a little bit more formal uh, liturgy people from the evangelical world find that a little bit different, takes a little bit getting used to. 
But if they stay even for a few weeks, they generally end up staying permanently. And uh, so that's that's what we're seeing. Yeah, I, I really I, I spoke to a visitor who came to our church a few weeks ago afterwards. And one of the things he said was, wow, it seems like you people really enjoy being at church. Yeah, <laughs> And he said it as if this is a bizarre thing, like all your people really like it here. Right, right. And I just take right. it for granted that, of course, exactly. you're being we forget church. to even talk about that part of it because we think, well, doesn't doesn't everybody yeah. isn't that your experience? And, and we are finding it, it often yeah. is not people's experience in their churches. So I, I really appreciate you talking about all of these positive things, because I think there can be the tendency, especially when you see other denominations and churches going woke or liberal in various ways right. to become the denomination that, oh, they're defined by what they're against. They're the anti-woke. They're the anti-feminist. Uh, and it's good to have that positive picture of, well, actually, we're pro-Bible. We're pro-worship. Right. We're pro-families. Yep. That's what we're for. The yep. things we're against flow from that. We're not defined by our angst or our frustration. Uh, and I think that's attractive to people as well. Well, and that's exactly right. And from my perspective, a lot of that flows out of our eschatology. You know, in the in the past, you know, most of us in our previous lives, 15 or 20 years ago, all came from some uh, semblance of a Baptist eschatology or a Baptist background. Uh, and so we had that uh, people my age grew up with late great planet Earth, Hal Lindsey, and, and, you know, the end times kind of thing and all of that. And that's that's a sort of a dour world. That's a world that looks forward to the world increasingly getting worse. And so we're going to lose more and more <clears throat> ground. And this is just the way it is. Um, our eschatology has a positive outlook. We believe that Jesus wins. We believe that Jesus wins in his, in history, in, in real time. That's not the end of all things. We believe in the final return of Jesus, the resurrection of the dead, and, and the final uh, death of sin and death uh, at, at the final consummation of all things. However, in the meantime, in the church age, the gospel wins. We go out and make disciples. We disciple the nations, and uh, the enemies of Christ are put under his feet. So even though we're in pretty sad times in our country, and, and the culture at large, and even the ch church culture, we have a very positive outlook of the church, the church, the broad church, maybe not the American church, but the church in the world, the kingdom of God, Christ's church, is doing just fine. It's bigger than it's ever been. It's growing faster than it's ever grown. It's being preached in more places than it's ever being preached. The Bible is understood and proclaimed and available in more places than it's ever been. And that is very exciting. And it helps us put in perspective our own little situation. And I, I think you see that on Sunday mornings. Our people are not dour. Um, you know, we have to encourage some of them. Some of them mm -hmm. get down and the, and the times can be trying at various times. But we have a very positive outlook about the future of the kingdom of God. And so we rejoice in it. We rejoice in what God is doing. And even these trying circumstances where we see perhaps a retraction of the growth and the maturity of the church in the United States, we believe that God is doing something big um, in the kingdom of God and that it's going, going to re result in good, good for us, good for the church. And so we don't walk around um doom and gloom and and sad about what's going on in the world we're very encouraged by what god is doing and and so we have a hopeful very hopeful eschatology so in in light of thinking about what god is doing in general in the world i want to talk a little about what god is doing in the crec as far as what you've seen over the last uh, six years what do you think are some opportunities we have coming up in the future and what do you think are some challenges that we're going to have to meet as we go forward as a denomination? Well, opportunities, we, we have a lot of growth right now. In our individual churches, we have a lot of interest in people planting churches. As, as you know, here in Virginia, we've got interest in people in Richmond. We've got interest in people in, in Roanoke. And so part of what we're thinking about is, well, if we do this, who's going to be the pastor, who are going to be the elders, who are going to be the next uh, leaders in the CREC. 
I'm getting older, as you said, I've served six years as the presiding minister. I've been in my church for 23 years. And some of the older guard of the CREC are also getting older. Uh, the, the reality is we need to replace ourselves and relatively soon, or we're going to be in trouble. We need new, uh, we need God to raise up, you know, workers for the harvest. And um, so that, that, that's uh, both an opportunity and a challenge. So we have the opportunity to grow. We have the opportunity to plant churches. There's a, a, a demand out there uh, for, to put in better terms, our, our product, uh, you know, faithful worship, preaching, practical Christian living, engagement of, of, of the culture in our daily lives and our daily callings. And, and so uh, in order to meet that demand, we have to plant new churches. In order to plant new churches, we need men to do that. That's a challenge for us right now. We're having a difficulty finding enough men to fill these spots. Um, there are, within the CREC, there's a few different training grounds that we have. Theopolis, we have <clears throat> Gray Friars out in Moscow, and uh, those are, have been ministries that have been around for a while and are doing an excellent job. We also are launching um, soon Reformed Evangelical Seminary, which is an effort, a collaborative effort of several CREC churches. So um, that is going to be run. It will be uh, all of the board members will be CREC members. Um, almost all of the teachers, if not all of the teachers and professors will be CREC pastors and elders. So we're hoping to expand the number of people that we can train and that we can still train them. They won't, they won't go off. It's going to be um, online. There may be some intensives that are in person, but it's going to be online. And the, the men will train under the mentorship of their local pastor, which fits <laughs> the way that we think we ought to train ministers. So we're really excited about that. That's a that's a big opportunity for us. That's going to launch officially this fall, 2023, and we're hoping that that will begin to build a pipeline of new CREC pastors for us in in say the next you know five to ten years. That we'll be able to have plenty of men whenever we have a church opening or a church launch. That we're actually going to have men to fill that spot. Yeah. Well, one thing I've noticed about the CREC that's a little different than other denominations is that often you have a, a pipeline from undergrad seminary straight into ministry as a pastor. Many CREC pastors, I would, I would say most of them uh, have out of college, had other careers, other jobs, started a family, and then come to the ministry a little bit later in life? Would you say that's by accident or that that's by design? And how would the Reformed Evangelical Seminary play into that? Yeah, I, I'd say both by accident, by design, because we didn't have our own pipeline, uh, you know, and and um, we didn't, as, as the denomination has grown, we're still young. This is our 25th anniversary this year. Um, a lot of people didn't know about us. I mean, we're more known now than we were 10 years ago. And I think we're going to be even much more well-known in the future. The Canon Plus app has been a huge benefit for the CREC because those guys have now a really large following. So a lot of people have found uh, Douglas Wilson and a lot of other guys. And then through them, they find uh, the CREC, Yuri Brito and, and others, and, and they find the CREC through them. And so the awareness of who we are has been uh, rapidly growing. And so um, that has created a, a much more interest. So we, I think it's really helpful if, if a guy graduates from college, maybe even um, uh, gets a job, he may go to seminary first, or he may get a regular job. I believe that's tremendously helpful for a pastor. I did that. I worked in the corporate world for uh, 10 plus years before I became a pastor. And I found that, that experience was really helpful in age and the things I learned in the corporate world, as as well as sitting in the same place and shoes of, of your congregants who have to you know, do day to day work, deal with a boss, deal with the corporate world, um, pay the bills, all those kinds of things. And if you go just sort of you always have been in ministry, you go to college, 
you go to seminary, you go into a church, you've never experienced um, the need to sort of pay your own way. Somebody else mm -hmm. is always paying your way. So it's not the worst thing. I think somebody could do that track and come out of seminary at, uh, I suppose they'd be 26 or 27 years old, become an assistant pastor or an associate pastor, serve under another pastor for a few years, and then maybe become a senior pastor. I, I think that would be okay. We now have the ability to do that. In mm -hmm. the, another thing, just in the past, so many of our churches were so small, they only had one pastor. So uh, all of the, uh, almost all of the churches were a one man show. Well, now we have quite a number of churches who can hire their second and third guy, as you know. Uh, we hired you a few years ago as a full-time pastor, and then we just hired another full-time pastor. So now we have three full-time pastors. So that's a great training ground for those men. Uh, if they get an opportunity to go to, on to be a lead pastor, then we can hire another guy, get him trained, and he, he can go off. So um, that's a new thing for us that's really changed dramatically in the last you know three to five years. And it's going to be a big positive and help our pastors get better training where they can uh, be successful. And back to your question, if some of these guys now get out of college, go straight to our seminary, graduate, and then become an assistant pastor, an associate pastor, serve in that capacity for three to five years, they could be in their early 30s then and have a lot of experience, um, which we didn't have before even those guys who put off going into the ministry till they were 35 they had world experience but then they were be getting their first pastorate at 40 with no pastoral experience so that's not necessarily a good thing either yeah so you're seeing the the seminary as an opportunity for men to work in their churches be getting the pastoral experience right. while at the same time receiving education training yeah, well, if they're yeah. if they're young guys, then maybe they're not yet an elder or an a, de a deacon. If they're a little bit older, maybe they're already an elder, ruling elder at their church, or serving as a deacon, or involved with the various ministries of their church. So yeah, this is a way to help get them even more experience, and then hopefully they would go not into straight into a senior pastor kind of role, but they would be an assistant pastor, or associate pastor, and they could get then another you know three or four years experience, so they don't just you know, we've seen guys go straight into ministry, first church, and then they get really beat up and then they don't want to be a pastor anymore. And they're, some of them are really good men and probably should be pastors. But, it, you know, you know they, they uh, decide they change their mind. It was too hard. They don't want to go yeah. down that path. So trying to build in some systems where we can have more success in creating, you know, lifelong pastors. Yeah. So one one final question here to wrap up. What are you excited about for the next 25 years of the CREC? We're, we're 25 years in. At the end of 50 years, where do you see the denomination? Where would you like to see us? What would you like to see happening? Yeah. Um, oh, I don't know. Uh, you know, we're 25 years in. We have 100 and some odd churches. Um I think we'll have a lot more churches. Uh, I'm sure in the next 25, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm very positive that we will double or triple or quadruple in size in that next 25 years. But the issue is, are we going to remain faithful? Um, it doesn't matter if we're big, if we compromise our faith in the Lord, if we compromise the scriptures, if we compromise our practice. As I mentioned earlier in the interview, we, uh, we've been we, we, we've weathered the storm of COVID and this cultural craziness the last few years, and we've been very solid. But are we going to maintain that? Mm -hmm. So the challenge is, um, are you going to continue to be able to 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 not um, feel the pressure of the outside culture to be faithful as church doing simple things, what we're called to do as churchmen? and as pastors. And if we can maintain that, then I hope and pray the Lord will add dramatically to our number. Yeah. If we don't, if we compromise, then I don't want him to add to our number, just like these other churches that have compromised and are have the, the, the candlestick has been taken out of their midst. 
well, I don't want those churches to grow. I don't want the PCUSA to grow. I don't want the American Episcopal Church to grow. I would like them to reform and repent and serve the Lord Jesus in truth, but I don't want them to grow in their current circumstances. So we're not after growth. We're after faithfulness and let the Lord add to our number as he sees fit. So I hope and pray that will be large, that we'll have a large influence in our local cities and a, a large influence in the broader culture, both in our churches, in our schools, our colleges, in New St. Andrews and, and other colleges that, that we may start and uh, various schools in our local towns that will have a large influence. But it's all contingent upon us remaining faithful. If we're, if we're faithful, Lord add to our number. If we're not faithful, then raise somebody else up who will be faithful. You know, I know I said that was the last question, but while you were talking, I was even thinking about those denominations you mentioned. Many of the big liberal denominations, they started out conservative, Bible-believing denominations, and they have really good confessions of faith, and really good structures in place, and those things didn't prevent them right. from going woke or liberal. And a lot of times, I think we think that if you just have the right confession, you're safe. Or if you just have right. the right document, that document will protect you. Um, thinking back to the Old Testament Israelites, it seems like they had the best documents. They had the best system. God gave it to them, and they still kept going astray. Right. So it seems like a lot of it has to do with your children, Correct. Where you, whether your children are faithful and whether uh, you're teaching them and reminding them, whether they're forgetting the Lord who bought them or whether they're remembering his blessings. Right. Uh, where do you see uh, that as part of the overall project of the CREC, the, the children, the education of children, the future of uh, the church in terms of that? Yeah, I'm glad you bring that up. That's another uh, another of our central pieces that we often take for granted and, and don't talk about much because it's just who we are. Um, we believe strongly in the, our, our central calling is to raise up faithful children. We believe that God's... Uh, 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 creation order to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth is still applicable today but we don't just fill the earth with offspring we want to fill the earth with faithful offspring and within this the crec we've had really good success if you will in raising faithful children now it's not a hundred percent uh retention of believing children in the next generation but it's a it's a high percentage of our children are not only in the faith in the Lord, they actually embrace our way of doing life, which is uh, faithful uh, worship, regular worship on the Lord's day, Christian education. Uh, most of our children in our churches are either homeschooled or are in a Christian school. They embrace Christ. They embrace our way of life. And that is pivotal. If you don't have that, if you if you lose the children, then of course your church is going to die out. The, the churches, denominations that we talked about, if you walk into those churches today, what will you see? You'll see the last remnant of 85-year-olds in their churches who are still there, no kids, no grandkids. If you walk into our churches, even now, like ours is 23 years old, which isn't really old as church goes. You know, I was the old guy for most of those years. But as you walk in, what you see is children and children's children. I'm now baptizing the children of kids I baptized in our church who grew up in our church, who now have stayed in our church and are having faithful children and we're baptizing their children. So this idea of covenant succession, uh, having our children's children in the Lord, Psalm 128, what a blessing to see your children's children in the Lord is a key part of who we are and what we're doing. And um, you know, education, family life, faithful Christian worship and fellowship is a big part of who we are. And we're seeing, uh, you know, in a practical aspect, practical um, sort of evaluation of it is that it works. Yeah. Amen. Well, Virgil, thank you for taking time to talk today. And thank you all for listening. This has been Kyperian Commentary and everybody have a wonderful day. Thanks, Rick. Blessings to you all.